Okay guys, so we are up to chapter 6, section 3. Corporate bonds. This is the most difficult, longest part. Again, it's a bond, we say long-term bond issued by corporations. A bond will have a lot of characteristics. How do we characterize bonds? Number one is bond in danger. The bond in danger, the, it, sorry, in danger is the legal contract for you, page, page, 169 on the textbook, 169, is the legal contract that specifies the rights and obligations of the issuer and of the investor. In general, contract specifies rights and obligations. So, when they give me an employment contract here, they specify clearly the rights of the employee, the obligations of the employee, the rights of the employer, the obligations of the employer. Obligations like to provide markers, right? These are the simple things that they got to do. To provide air conditioning. So if there is, for example, electricity, right? So, this is what the indenture does. And an indenture or any contract will have certain clauses that are called covenants. Covenants. A covenant is a particular clause, clause. In a contract that specifies or regulates or arranges a particular problem, a particular issue or a particular case a particular circumstance. What if there is a revolution? What if the currency collapses? What if the banking system shuts down? So, there will be plenty of covenants. Sometimes we call these bond covenants. Because covenant is a general word. The covenant in general means agreement. So this will be bond covenant. So when a bond is issued, it will have many people who buy the bond. The buyers of a bond we call investors. Okay, and because there will be thousands and thousands of different investors, there has to be somebody who works on behalf of the investors and who will take care of the investors, who will protect the interest of the investors. And that person, it's a legal body, is called a trustee. Trustee is a person or a financial institution or a department in a financial or other, let's say, legal institution, law firm, that will protect, that will act on behalf of investors and will protect their interests. 
it will act as a bond holder, as a bond holder representative. Now, when we say investors, we also use the, 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 the word bond holder. There's one word, bond holder. Investor is a generic word. If the investor purchased stock, becomes stockholder. Okay? So, bondholder, trustee is a representative of the bondholder. The trustee uh, has a special function. The function is called of a monitor. A monitor is someone who observes and records behavior and maybe irregularities. In other words, the monitor is watching out for problems or the opposite, that there are no problems. Uh, a bond, usually corporate bond, will have what's called a transfer agent. Transfer agent is, again, a person, usually a department in a bank or financial institution, which keeps record of the owners of the bond, means keeps record of the bondholders, okay? So, transfer agent's job is when there is a purchase to, or sale, to remove the seller from the list of bondholders and to add the buyer. Literally, you scratch the one person and you add another person to the list. That's how it was done. Now, it may be that uh, before you had 10 bonds, you will scratch two or three. So it's say, oh, now I got seven, meaning they reduce your number to three, and somebody else will have extra three. So uh, the monitor transfer will do a number of things. Part of the monitor will be that it informs, informs bondholders if there's a problem. If there's a problem, there's anything, if there's any news, something else, he keeps bondholders informed. And the second part is to initiate, initiate legal action. If there is a problem with the bond, maybe the bondholder, oh, sorry, the issuer, the corporation does not follow its rules, does not follow the obligations, or can't pay, or whatever the problem is. If the problem requires legal action, usually the trustee will initiate a legal action. All right. Well, now we got a whole bunch of different types of bonds. So we do this like bond types. Number one will be, again, fairly straightforward, we, we covered it before, will be bearer. Bearer bonds will be bonds with a certificate payable to the bearer, whoever has it in their pocket, whoever has it. The bearer, we see, is said, is, that's how it's said in English, it's a special word, is to clip, to clip. Coupons. So, clipping is associated with, if you have hair, clip the hair. Clipping is, you take a piece of paper and then just cut, 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 cut. 
usually the bond will be a nice piece of paper like this. The coupons will be here on the right. Coupon 1, coupon 2, coupon 3. If it's a 5 year bond, it's going to have 10 coupons. You cut, cut, cut. You take the coupon, you present it to the bank, and you will get a payment. So that will be a bearer bond. The alternative will be registered bond. Again, this bearer and register is identical to what we studied already with other instruments. Bearer and register are generic terms that are used in finance and in law. With register, the bond, there is a central list of all bondholders. So when the time comes for each bondholder, there will be information where and how to make the payment. So they'll just make a transfer, they'll wire the money to the bank or whatever you have it. Okay, next one will be number two, term bonds. Now I'm moving into page 171, you'll see a whole bunch of different types of bonds. A term bond. is a bond in which the whole issue matures on one particular date. So, if you have a 10 million bond issue, okay, on, when the, on the date of maturity, the corporation must come with 10 million in cash and pay back the issue. Well, term bonds are considered somewhat, somewhat risky because on the day of payment, Maybe they will have, maybe they will not have all 10 million in cash sitting in the bank to make the payment. So, the next one will be number three, serial bonds. Sir, can you uh, talk about the term bond again? The term bond, yes, is very simple. All bonds, meaning the term bond will, will be, let's say, uh, just for your example, 10 million worth. That's the bond issue, the total size of the bond issue. Well, if it's 10 million, one bond will be $1,000. How many bonds you will have on a $10 million issue? For a $10 million issue, you're going to have 10,000 bonds. You own two, you own three, you're rich, you own 100, right? So, a total of 10,000. This means that on the date of maturity, all 10,000 must be paid on that one particular date. And the corporation must come up with 10 million in cash. It must have that cash available and if they don't they get in trouble okay so the term bond is a little risky because if the issue is large maybe a hundred million dollars maybe one billion dollars they might not have just one billion dollars sitting in the bank or worse they may have one billion dollars sitting in the bank but the bank will not have one billion dollars tomorrow morning to make a payment. The bank doesn't just keep one billion dollars sitting in the bank either. So you may think you have the money in the bank, but the bank doesn't have it on that date. Okay? So these, especially if they're large amounts, could present a problem. So you may have a, instead a serial bond. Sometimes it's called serial, okay? And it matures on a series of dates. Okay. So, for example, today is 2016, and it will mature on 2025, 2026, 2027, 
and so on. And here in 2025, we will mature 2 million on. Here, 2 million on. Here, 2 million on. So they're going to have five different dates, usually years, but five different dates. And in each, you're going to have 2 million maturing. Well, if it's a company, it's a lot easier to come up five times with 2 million as opposed to one time with 10 million. Well, think if the bond issue is $1 billion. It's a lot more difficult to come up with one billion payment. But you may spread it as 10 payments, and each payment will be, let's say, 100 million, 100 million, 100 million. That's a lot easier. So this is all about spreading a large number of payments. Well, in your case, think of it, you want to buy a house, and the seller says uh, 100,000 US dollars. Well, can you just go to the bank or get from your pocket $100,000. Well, that's not so easy, all right? You may say, well, I can borrow the money and then you're gonna be paying over one year or over five years or over 10 or over 20. That's all it is, just spreading. Next one will be number four. Again, I can use the same word from last time. Number four. Mortgage bonds. <coughs> Let's see with mortgage bonds. Here, when they say mortgage bonds, it's a little trickier. They say that these are bonds which are secured with particular projects, okay? But you still have to understand the project is associated with real estate. So somehow the project has real estate. If it's a factory, the factory building probably with the factory land itself. Okay? So you have certain project, that's certain economic activity, it has real estate with it. That real estate will be securing the mortgage bonds. There's also a possibility that the factory machines, the factory equipment will also be securing these mortgage bonds. So it might not be only the real estate, it may be also machines and equipment. Now, here comes a trickier part. Here comes a trickier part. If it is secured with machines and equipment, and here's the trick, but no real estate. It's not anymore a mortgage bond. It's got a new name. It's called Equipment Trust Certificate. Equipment Trust Certificate. Equipment Trust Certificate, that's on page 171, close to the very bottom. Again, is a type of a mortgage bond, but technically it is not a mortgage bond. It's simply a bond which is secured with machines and equipment and not with real estate. Mortgage bonds are considered to be secured by real estate machines and equipment. And if they're considered to be secured, they're considered to be lower risk. In general, secured bonds are considered to be lower risk than unsecured bonds. And lower risk will usually imply lower return, is in lower interest rates. Let's see what's next one. Next one is called, uh, was it number five? 
debenture, debenture. Now, this is confusing again because debenture sounds like indenture and they are completely unrelated. Indenture is a contract, okay, between two people or two parties. Debenture is simply unsecured bonds. It's a generic term for un secured bond and you should simply now it's unfortunately have to memorize the simple difference between debenture and indenture they're completely different things but it's easy to confuse because they both kind of like are in denture okay debenture indenture they sound similar but they're completely different things, unrelated. Then you have the next one, number six. Number six is subordinated debenture. Now we need to Take here uh, another brand new explanation. Debt can be considered senior, senior any debt. This applies to any kind of debt, any kind of loan and be considered senior. Senior means that when money is short and money is not enough, money is not sufficient, and you have two types of debts. One of them will be senior, the other one will be junior, And today, right, you're the senior, we call it creditor, right? And you're unfortunately the junior creditor. And I gotta pay both 1,000 each today, but I don't have 2,000. I have only 1,300. In that case, you, the senior, get the full amount of money and you get whatever is left. So you will get your 1,000 in full and you will get only 300 or whatever I have available. So senior debt gets paid first and junior gets paid after the senior. So senior is always, we say, serviced first to service your debt service. So senior gets paid first in full and only then junior debt is paid. Okay. And on top of that you may have another type. We've already discussed it. It's secured. So this gets now trickier, I'll try again to explain. If it's secured, it is secured with a particular asset. Maybe it's secured with a car, maybe it's secured with a truck, maybe it's secured with real estate. So if it is secured, then the particular asset cannot be used for anything else except for the payment of the secured debt. So the asset will be sold and if the money is enough it will pay the secured debt and after the secured debt is paid then 
will get paid the senior debt. Okay. And if the money is not enough, after, so for example, I owe you $1,000, I've secured it with a motorcycle, and the motorcycle sells for $700, uh, I'm paying you the $700, the other $300, you become unsecured. And unsecured will be between senior and junior, okay? So, the 700 gets paid, the other 300, you'll have to wait like everybody else. So, secured means you sell the asset and you use the money, we call it use the proceeds, to pay the secured debt. If there is left over, you take care of senior debt. If there's not money left over, then the secured will have to wait like everybody else. And now we get to the subordinated. Subordinated has, in this particular case, meaning of junior. Subordinated in this particular case means below unsecured. Below unsecured. So, first we'll get paid the secured, then we'll get paid the senior, then we'll get paid the unsecured, we can add this here as unsecured. <coughs> unsecured, basically subordinated has in general the meaning after all other credits are paid, if there is any money left, the subordinated debt will get paid, okay? And from here, it's going to become subordinated bond. Subordinated bond. Subordinated bond. So, subordinated bond and the same as subordinated debt. Debt is just a loan. And this the bond is a loan with a particular document. So, next one will be number seven. If it's a general debt, it is a debt. If it's a bond, a bond is a special type of debt with a certificate and all the characteristics that we study. The difference between bond and debt is that the bond will usually have pieces of paper, if, for example, like number one, bearer bond. Number two, the bond will have many bondholders. Each bond will be worth $1,000, only $1,000. If you own three, you're going to have 3000 She's rich, she will have 30, so she's going to have 30000 so, the bond is just a slice of the total debt. And a slice which is standard for 1,000 US dollars. And there may be 10,000 bonds representing the whole bond issue. With a debt, usually there's only one creditor, and that's usually a bank, a commercial bank. Could be some other financial. So the debt is usually held by one, two, or three financial institutions. With a bond, it may be 5,000 different people. Some of them will be insurance companies, some of them will be commercial banks, again, some of them will be individuals, some of them will be mutual funds, hedge funds. Anybody can hold one or a few bonds. So that's the basic difference. They both represent debt, okay? But the bond has all the other characteristics. There will be many investors, there will be trustees, there will be a monitor, and all the other things. Back to number seven, convertible. A convertible bond is a 
bond that may be converted to, we say, exchanged for another security of the issuer. Now, that's the correct, precise definition. Is a bond that can be exchanged for another security of the issuer. Now, there is a special case. The most common of all will be that it's convertible to stock. So, it may be convertible to any other security, but 90 or 99% of the time, it's convertible to stock. And you will have, if it's stock, because that's what's most common in the real world, you'll have a conversion ratio. Conversion ratio is the number of new securities which you get for one bond. For example, for the stock, you may get 50 shares of stock. You may get 50 shares of stock. Okay? And it comes the following. If the stock is, let's say, $20, you may convert 50 shares times $20. You're going to get $1,000 worth of stock. Or you can keep $1,000 worth of a bond. If the share is $15, okay, so you still get 50 shares. If it's 15, then it's 750. Your shares will be worth 750. It is not worth converting the bond into stock because there's only loss. But if you have a price of 25 and you get 50 shares, that's 1,250. In that particular case, it becomes profitable. We say in finance you have a gain here you have a loss of 250 and here you have a gain. So you gain by converting the bond into the stocks, into the 50 shares of stock. So if there is a gain, you have two options. You have the option to hold the bond and convert at a later time and you still try to keep the gain. Or you can convert now and you can pocket the gain now. Okay? It's a whole different subject of when is the best time to convert a bond. We don't even bother with this. This is very advanced. It's a part of securities and options. Now you need, just need to understand what is a convert, convertible bond and what is a conversion ratio. Okay? Next is a number eight, stock war. So, warrant is an option to buy stock at a given price, at the given price, up to a particular date. So, they may say the price is $20 by the year of 2020. So, this will be a four-year $20 warrant. Okay, and a stock warrant will be essentially the, again, this is not the complete definition, is essentially the right to buy the stock at a particular price up to a particular uh, date. Now, there will be a bond, and the bond will be similar to what I showed you, just a piece of paper, and it may have 
one, it may have, let's say, 10 warrants. So here is a warrant, 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 warrant. So it may come with many warrants, it may come with only one warrant. And a stock warrant will be a bond, and you can clip instead of interest, you can clip the warrant, and you can use the warrant to buy the stock. When you buy the stock, you'll, of course, have to pay for the stock. And the company will issue stock. Okay, let's see what else we got here about stock warrants. So, we call this, when you purchase the stock, we say that you exercise, exercise the warrant. To exercise the warrant means to use it, the warrant, in order to purchase the stock. And in finance it's amazingly simple with warrants. If the price of the stock is above the warrant, let's say the price is 23, you will exercise the warrant at 20 and then sell the stock at 23 and pocket the difference of 3. If the stock price is 15, obviously you can go on the market and buy for 15 as opposed to exercising the warrant and pay 20. There's no point in paying 20 when the market is 15. If you want to buy the stock, you buy it at 15. So you exercise when the price of the stock is above the warrant price. And if it's below, you don't exercise. The opposite is that it, here's another important word in finance, it expires. To expire means to die. To expire for a warrant means to reach the end of the period and to lose validity. So after 2020, maybe January 1, if the warrant expires, means you can no longer use it. It's no longer valid. So, if the price of the stock falls, uh, sorry, rises above, it will be exercised. If it never rises above, you let the warrant expire. So, it becomes, we call this, an option. It's a call option. Did you study before options yes. in the derivatives? So the warrant becomes a call option. Well, we'll study it again in a couple of weeks, maybe after the midterm. All right. Let's see what else we got over here. So callable bond number nine. A callable bond will be, will have what is called a call provision. I'll get about five minutes, but you can go, right? Give me about five minutes. I finish with two more. We'll take a break. As a call provision. And a call provision means that the issuer can buy back the bond within a certain period at a particular price. So, the, it may be that the bond price will rise and the issuer will decide that they can buy it cheaper from the... So, call provision will force the investor or the bondholder will force the investor, whether they want or not, to give back to the issuer the bond and the issuer will buy at a certain price. So, let's try this. If the bond has a face value of uh, 1,000, the call price will be 1,020. 
So they have, let's say, between the fifth and the tenth year, or between the tenth and the twentieth year, at any point in time, if they have a call provision, to pay 1,020 and get the bond back. It may be profitable under certain circumstances. The most common case is when interest rates fall. So before you're paying for the bond 8% interest, now interest rates fall to 4%. It makes sense for you to buy back the bond and issue a brand new bond at 4%. So instead of paying 8% for so many years, now you're going to be paying 4%. Usually, we call this refinancing. Refinancing is the issue of new debt. It could be credit, it could be a bond. The issue of new debt used to pay back an old debt. So you borrow money to pay back your debt. And refinancing makes sense when interest rates fall significantly because you borrow the new money at a lot lower interest rates. This from 1000 is the face value and this is called the call price. You have a Call price uh, 1020. The difference of 20 becomes the call premium. Call premium is the extra amount of money that you have to pay over face value to call the bond. The call premium here is. $20. So the face value is 1000 the call premium is 20 and the call price becomes 1020 Call premium, the definition is the difference between call price and face value. Okay, last one before we take the break. That's the last one. It's called sinking funds. Uh, it's a little trickier. Nine, ten. It's a little trickier. It's very confusing. They uh, are successful to confuse me. Sinking fund is amount of money used to pay down a bond uh, and needs a lot of explanation. A different way of saying it is that sinking, there is a what's called a sinking fund provision. Sinking fund provision is a provision in a contract that every so many months or every year that let's say the issuer must regularly buy back some bonds. So the sinking fund makes the bond look like a serial. So, sinking fund, for example, means the following. Uh, the total debt is 10 million, and for the, let's say, between year 5 and year 10, there is 
annual sinking fund of one million dollars. So in year five, the borrower, meaning the issuer, must pay or will pay to the trustee one million dollar. And the trustee will choose 10% of bondholders and pay back their money. The next year, they'll do the same. In the year after that, they'll do the same. Essentially, in this particular case, what I gave you a simple example is, after year five, you got to pay back, or same as buy back, 10%. And after year six, you buy back 10%. And after year seven, 10%, 10%, 10%. So these are already 50, and the last one will be 50%. So the whole idea is the same as with serial bonds. Instead of having a huge payment at the very end, and for example, you've got to make a payment of 10 million, but you got only three or five, and you get in trouble, you already paid quite a bit of it. And at the very end, it's not a big amount left. Spreading the payments is considered to be less risky. Or you've already made three payments before you get in trouble. Well, it's better to get in trouble with a seven million in debt as opposed to 10 million in debt. So somehow, the sinking fund is generally thought to be lower risk and a sinking fund provision will be the debt will be considered lower risk and lower return okay and that's good enough for the types of bonds and for a break yes